Among the party seeing the Prime Minister off at London Airport was the daughter of the Ghana High Commissioner. This was the beginning of a tour, which may be a milestone in the history of Africa. A statesmanlike undertaking characteristic of Mr. Macmillan. The good wishes of all Britain are with him every minute he is away. During his five-week, 15,000-mile African tour, the Premier will begin by visiting Ghana and Nigeria. Accra, capital of Ghana, went wild with joy when Dr. Nkrumah was released from political imprisonment in 1951. His enthusiastic followers had elected him to power. The independence of the former Gold Coast colony was thereby assured. A born leader, Dr. Nkrumah dreams of a united Africa with himself its chief ruler. Nigeria, home of 36 million people producing tin, coal and other minerals, will present the uh, with very different scenes. Mainly, however, the Federation of Nigeria is agricultural. Groundnuts are one of its biggest crops. In this country, it's a highly profitable crop. So too is the production of palm oil with palm kernels, cocoa and maize helping to form the wealth economy of this vast land. Go to the Federation of Rhodesia and the Asaland. Mr. Macmillan will encounter a quite different political climate. His airliner may disturb wild animals in the natural reserves. Rhodesia is under white cup. The world famous Victoria Falls still awe the tourist, who recalls amidst that spectacle that only 104 years ago they were first beheld by a white man the explorer missionary, Dr. Livingstone. But it is upon the capital Salisbury that the outside world earns critical attention today. For in the Federation, coloured people outnumber Europeans 30 to 1. Yet when the Governor-General Lord Llewellyn opened the first federal parliament in 1904, it was essentially a Westminster-type ceremony. And in the copper mines of Northern Rhodesia, third largest producer in the world, the rule is white administration, coloured labour. The same combination constructed the far-famed Kariba Dam. The Federation Premier, Sir Roy Walensky, is in no hurry to change the existing balance between white and coloured races, claiming that in Rhodesia, it is a good workable arrangement. The protectorates of Basutaland, Bechuanaland and Swaziland will be visited when Mr Macmillan goes to South Africa. Tribal chiefs have been admitted to local governmental authority in Basutaland, and documents of appointment were given to each in a briefcase. Each one felt halfway to being a civil servant. Links with the not distant past, when the colored man owned Africa, are still treasured outside town. And the Union of South Africa never forgets that black men outnumber whites four to one. The fear that the coloured men may one day overwhelm the white is at the back of the South African government's segregation policy. <laughs> Johannesburg, with a population of more than a million, is a magnificent city. Gold mine workings, visible on the outskirts, remind old-timers that the discovery of the precious metal only 74 years ago was the foundation of Joburg's wealth. But even here, the existence of the Black Sash movement, protesting against government policy, shows that many white South Africans agree with Anglican Father Huddleston in fighting segregation. Huddleston was brought back to England by his order. His work goes marching on. So in 1960, Table Mountain looks down upon an unhappy situation. The Union is in the British Commonwealth. In outlook, it is often poles apart. No one nowadays can call at the home of General Smuts. His wisdom went with him to the grave. Nor can Macmillan, in a brief visit, provide a substitute. But he is an unusual man, and the African millions, increasingly aware of this day and age, may come to bless Macmillan's name. So in that continent may all the great peoples that owe allegiance to the crown.